Hey friends, welcome back to the Wild at Heart podcast here in the week of January 10th. John and Alan in the studio this week, continuing with some thoughts uh, on how to find strength and resilience and new life, some orientation going into 2022. And even though we're only a few days in, I can really use that already. So (laughs) I'm glad we're talking about this. Me, me, big me. (laughs) But I can't even talk about the year, to be honest. I can talk about the semester. Hmm. I found that even tackling the year right now just feels vague and daunting and it's just too much. Give me a semester. I can think about (laughs) January to June. I can think about that. Yes. And so even in the podcast last week, we were talking about consecrating the year, consecrating your calendar, consecrating your life, da, da, da. Right. And, and then asking for words. Even in some of that, I found myself focusing on, Jesus, I give you this semester. I give you this half. I give you these six months. That's really good. Yeah. So gang, I'm going to share some things that are on my heart this week, but what we are going to do is devote a number of the podcasts this spring to resilience and strength, life, restoration, because we think that's what we need. We think that's where we're at. And sometimes our you know, battle cry is mission and rescuing people's hearts and all that is super important, still believe in it, still doing it every day. But this feels like the hour of the 10 bridesmaids. Let me explain what I mean by that. We're actually going to go more into this in coming weeks, but I'm going to give you a teaser right now. I think that this hour on the earth is the hour of the 10 bridesmaids. In Matthew 25, Jesus tells a parable, but in order to understand the context of it, he's just finished riffing in Matthew 24 on the pressures of living towards the end of the age, what that's like for people, the heaviness of heart, the fear that gets in, the wars and rumors of wars and all that stuff that just assaults the soul. And he gives us some really beautiful counsel for resilience, for finding a centeredness in him, finding life in him. So he does that in Matthew 24, including just the beautiful sentence towards the end of the chapter where he says, do not let your hearts be weighed down. Mm, That's (laughs) helpful. I'm like, what? Like we can choose whether or not we let our hearts be weighed down. That's been really helpful to me recently. So he does that in Matthew 24. and, And then in Matthew 25, he tells a parable. And the parable goes like this. I'm reading in the New Living Translation. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough oil for their lamps, but the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, they were roused by the shout, look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. All the bridesmaids got up, prepared their lamps, and then the five foolish ones asked the others, please give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. But the others replied, we don't have enough. For all of us, go to a shop, buy some for yourselves. But while they were gone to buy oil, the bridegroom came. And then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door. But he called back, I don't know you. So, Jesus concludes, you too must keep watch, for you do not know the day or hour 
of my return. Now, what's fascinating about this parable is that in many places, Alan, the disciples either later or even within the context of the teaching, Jesus will provide interpretation. Yes. So the sower and the seed. He's like, well, I'm the sower and the seed is the word of God. And he goes on and says, these people are mm -hmm. shallow and they burn out quickly and these people persevere and they bear, right? Okay. Right. Yeah. Right. So yeah. he does that a number of times where if not publicly, then privately, but to us in the scriptures, he'll give interpretation. This one has no interpretation. He's just, <laughs> he's just riffed on the end of the age, and then he lays this thing down. Right, right. And it's the one I would most want interpretation on right? if I could pick. It's unnerving. Right. Yes. And I think he meant it to be, right? It's like a mm. good movie trailer. They don't tell you everything. They just tell you enough yes. to intrigue you to get you to go, wait, what? <laughs> right. Wait, the kingdom of heaven is like what? And there's five and five and five run out. There's several things in this parable that I absolutely love. And one of them is the bridegroom was delayed. Mm -hmm. I think the NIV says the bridegroom was a long time in returning. <laughs> so Jesus admits, he goes, I know, I know it looks like it's been a really long time, Wow! but don't lose heart. Yeah. They all become drowsy mm -hmm. and fall asleep, and then there's the wise and the foolish. I think what the parable is about is the oil. That's the key thing. Don't run out of oil. Don't burn out. And thinking about how oil is used in the Old Testament, the New Testament, often in conjunction with the Holy Spirit, I think the oil is the presence of God in our lives. That's what we run on, right? We yeah. run on the wow. oil That's good. that is God. And what he's warning about is everything that happens in Matthew 24, the pressures of an hour like this. Mm -hmm. He talks about love growing cold just because of the evil in the world and how the evil just burns you out hearing this report and that injustice and this atrocity, right? Yes. So there's all that. Right. And then the warning is, don't run out of the presence of God in your life. Cultivate it, take care of it. The wise ones even bring along a little extra. Interesting. Yeah. And I think what also confirms that, that the oil is the presence of God is when the, when the foolish bridesmaids wake up and realize they're running out, they ask the wise, hey, just share some with us. Mm -hmm. But you actually can't share your life with God with someone else. You, you, you can't impart the, the deposit you have. You can teach, you can share, you can pray, you can do those things. Yeah. But in terms of a life in God has to be cultivated by every individual. It's not like you can write checks on somebody else's. <laughs> yeah. You know? This parable has been one that's been one of the most unnerving to me that I'm least comfortable with over time. And your explanation really sheds some light on it because I wasn't clear exactly what the oil was. Right. And if you just read it on the surface, it can even feel a little bit harsh when they run off, go get some and come back and they're locked out. Yeah. And it's like, ugh, like that's, I don't want to be locked out or caught off guard or or the one running on empty. But in our culture and world today, that's a phrase I use all the time is, man, I'm running on fumes. I'm running on empty. I have nothing. And this feels like it's speaking directly to that. Yeah. Why am I hearing the old Jackson Brown song <laughs> in my head? You know, I love run that song. on empty. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And I think because of Matthew 24, the, the world that we live in right now is draining. It's a draining experience. Even just the amount of media, the information, trying to stay up on stuff. Right. What's the latest pandemic news? What do I need to know? Hey, we want to go see my folks. Can we still travel? I mean, just everything about that. 
what are the kids doing this semester? Mm -hmm. It's draining. Mm -hmm. And the loving counsel of Jesus is you must cultivate oil, cultivate the presence of God in your life. So what we want to help you with this year, what we want to help you with this semester, friends, is more of God, more of God, more oil. And the question I'd like to put before us all, and I'm going to throw this at you, Alan, unprepared, Uh is how will you arrange your days, friends, to bring you more of God? If we're assuming that everything about this world is designed to drain you of God, to just, you know, get you distracted and depleted, distracted and depleted, stressed out, upset, right? Right, right. How will you arrange your days then? How do you be intentional? Parables clearly about being intentional. Yeah. How will you be intentional this spring, right here, this semester, to arrange your days to bring you more of God? Can I put you on the spot? Sure. Yeah. For me, I would say when I just get up and charge into the day, it rarely happens. And I've just discovered that about myself. If I wake up and immediately check my phone for messages or think of a crisis or something I'm concerned about or trying to work through, and I don't start with God, John, then it's like, I'm running on empty the whole day and I'm running behind and I'm not grounded. And so what I have tried to do recently and what's been super helpful is before my feet hit the floor, I will lay there for an extra minute, two minutes and just say, God, what do you have for me today? For us today, any advanced words, anything you want to share with me, And it really helps me focus on him before anything else. And when I do that, I do feel like I have more of God during the day because it it sets the interpretation and expectancy for the day, right? Yes. But when I don't do that, I feel like I'm carrying the weight of the world. I'm trying to figure it all out. Yes. And, And I'm doing damage control that's retroactive instead of proactive. I'm thinking of St. Patrick's breastplate. Mm -hmm. He begins his day by saying, I arise. So apparently he's still in bed. That's good. He says, I arise today through a mighty strength, through the invocation of the Trinity. So immediately it's God. Yes. Strengthen me for this day. Impart to me all that I need for this day. And so the question, how will you arrange your days so that you do not run out of God? You do not run out of the presence of God, the intimacy, the sustaining graces, the help of God in your life. And what we do want to talk about this week is we just released a journal that we think is going to be super cool and really helpful to you. It's called the One Minute Pause Journal. Now, if you've been listening to the podcast at all, if you've been tracking with us over the last couple of years, you know that we released an app right before the pandemic called the One Minute Pause. And it's such a Jesus story because we're not an app company. We've never done that before. Right. We won't, right. probably won't do it again. But we were compelled, moved, pushed by God mm-hmm. to invite people to learn simply how to pause, how to release everything to him, how to center ourselves in Christ, yes. and how to receive him again, receive oil. And I wouldn't have put it at that time. I didn't even have the... Mm-hmm the 10 bridesmaids in mind at the time that we created it. I was just aware that prior to the pandemic, modern life was really wearing me out. And I needed several times a day to just pause, even if it's only 60 seconds. Yes. Give everything to Christ, be restored in him, and then receive his love, receive his life. So that's within the one minute pause app, there's a one minute 
there's a three minute, there's a five minute pause, and there's a 10 minute. And we're adding new pauses mm -hmm. this semester, which are going to be very, very exciting. We've got some new stuff coming we're really stoked about. But we did add new pauses in the fall. There's a five minute mental strength pause because we found that we and all our friends were just getting fried mentally. That was so helpful. And there's a 10 minute mental health, mental strength pause as well. But rather than trying to describe it to you, there's nothing like experiencing it. So we're going to play the one minute pause from the app right now, the music, the guided prayer. The only thing you're missing is the imagery, which is a, a beautiful mm -hmm. picture of nature. But if you're driving, don't close your eyes. <laughs> Please. <laughs> but um, we're just going to settle in for a moment. This will literally take us 60 seconds to enjoy what it's like to recenter ourselves in God. It's got three sections. We're going to release everything to Christ. We're going to restore our union with him, ask him to restore our union, and ask him to fill us. Jesus. I give everyone and everything to you. I give everyone and everything to you, God. I give myself to you, Jesus, for union with you. I am created for union with you, God. I give everything in me for union with you, Lord. I need more of you, God. Fill me with more of you. That's good. That's enough for now. When we built the pause, we knew that if we only asked people to do 60 seconds, they would do it, which gives you an idea of the insane hour <laughs> that we live in, right? Right. If you have to like strong arm people and beg and persuade to just take 60 seconds of their day for God, you know, you know. you're in a messed up world. But what's beautiful is um, that's not the best pause. Like the three minute, oh, it's so much better. The five minute, yeah, incredible. Yeah. But ask yourself after that one minute pause that you just heard, how does your spirit feel different? Do you feel as empty or do you sense that you are more filled with God? And that to me is the beauty of when we're looking for more of God, Things like that are immensely helpful. They're not complex or complicated, yes, but they're immensely helpful when you make time for more of God in easy ways like that. Yes. So the one minute pause, the whole idea of the experience and the three stages of the practice, benevolent attachment, releasing everything, releasing the news, releasing your kids, releasing the stress, the fears centering in Christ, restoring our union with him, and then receiving, and not just receiving, I love the language, saturate me with your love, yes. saturate me with your life. That came out of my spiritual life. That was a practice that I had developed for myself out of necessity prior to us ever creating the app. And here's the confession, and I stopped doing it. <laughs> Right? Even the inventor, <laughs> even even the creator wow. of it, yes. I, I stopped doing it. And I picked up the pause again this fall, but I had let it go for a long time and just got swept up in, quote, other things, other distractions. Well, I want to finish this this podcast I'm listening to, or, well, I'm listening to some music. That counts. Or, you know. So That's interesting. Too. mercy, yeah. compassion, we understand that creating a, a pattern and a habit of doing the pause takes a little practice, but it's worth it. It's free. If you haven't downloaded it from the app store, go do that. And if you gave up the practice like I did, this would be a good time of yeah. year to get back into it. I received the most beautiful letter the other day from 
a older boy, a beautiful young man who had put in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of minutes on the pause app. I think he was at 600 minutes. It might be more. And he was just describing how he had been wrestling with some anxiety, how much it had helped him. So it works. And what we wanted to do was create a physical experience of that. Digital works great. Your mm -hmm. phone is right there. The audio, the music track, all that's really beautiful. But we, we asked ourselves, could we recreate this in a physical experience, in a journal? And so we just released, it just came out last week, the One Minute Pause Journal, because having it in front of you, having the opportunity to write down, this is what I need to release. This is what I need from God, to pray the prayers to read a scripture every day. We just thought that would be really helpful. And we created a mock-up for us back in, in 21, and we started playing with it and doing it ourselves. Yes. So yes. we all, we all kind of did it to figure out, does this work? And it does, it works beautifully. So the way it, the way it works, gang, you open the journal up, and first off, there's a lot of really good content on how to pause and why benevolent detachment and how that works, et cetera, why the stages, how they work. But then when you begin the uh, journal, which is uh, it's got 90 days worth of pausing in it, on the left-hand side is the morning, on the right-hand side is the afternoon or evening, which is kind of figuring you're going to pause twice a day. And the difference, of course, than the digital experience is you get to write this stuff down. You get, what is it that I need to release today? Right. And to linger with that, and then what is it that I need from God? And reading through it, praying through it, is a really cool experience. It is. And it's one thing with the Pause app to close your eyes, to listen, to meditate, to be transformed that way. But John, there's something about a tactile experience of seeing and writing words on a page and actually in your handwriting, going through that journey of your morning and afternoon, which is some simple questions and, and simple things to do. And to me, what's an added benefit is then, you know, if you ask me, hey, Alan, when you, when you did the one minute pause back last November 15th, what were you thinking? Uh, right now, I would have no idea, right? Yep. But now with the journal, I can actually look back and see the things God and I have worked on, how I've overcome those things, released those things, matured. And so having that on your shelf, your nightstand, your desk, I think is going to be a really cool experience for people. Yeah. For some people, this is a nightstand thing. They want to do it first thing in the morning and last thing in the evening. Mm -hmm. For other folks, they want it on their desk at work because it's halfway through the morning and halfway through the afternoon that they desperately need to pause right, because right. that that's when I'm spun up. It's about 10 a.m. in the morning and about 2 p.m. in the afternoon that I have gotten completely spun up in the day. And that's when I need it. So yeah, it's available, gang, on Amazon now. It's called the One Minute Pause Journal. And what we're talking about, to bring us back to the theme here, is oil. We're talking about more of the presence of God in your life. How will you arrange your days to provide for, to receive, to access more of the presence of God in your life? And this is one offering. Mm -hmm. uh, there's the digital version of the free pause app. There's the one minute pause journal. But just to even riff on journaling for a moment, were you always a journaler? No, I wasn't. And in fact, in my younger you know, days, in my growing up years and 20s, I really, I really hesitated to journal because I think I wanted to not dig that deep. And I didn't think I'd like what I saw. And I didn't think I would hear from God. And so it felt like this this ritual, if I did it, where it wasn't probably going to be something I'd want to look at later, and I sure wouldn't want other people to see it later. 
And I didn't understand how it led to intimacy with God or really helped me dive into my story with God. And so for me, John, the real shift was when I started realizing a journal to me, and I, and I carry one, I have one here at the table. I carry a journal with me now everywhere I go, basketball games, restaurants, if I'm going out to dinner with the family, in the, in the truck, wherever I am, I have this out with a pen in it. And the reason why now is because it it's an expectancy that God is going to show up and have things to say. And there are questions I have that are invitations into deeper intimacy with God. And so even if it's not a revelation, if it's just pain or a question or a struggle, I don't have to solve it in the journal, but but putting it in writing to me helps me on this journey of life by kind of trail markers and reminders and stones of remembrance. And so I've really shifted in the last probably 15 years, and it's one of my favorite things now. And it's actually on my bookshelf at home, the top shelf, the main shelf isn't books by other people. It's the journey that God's had me on, and the journals reflect that. Mm, yeah, it's a powerful thing to look back through your journal. I I do that every year because I want to grab like the best of the best. Mm-hmm whether it was a lesson I learned or a word from God or some beautiful experience, I'll bring those into the new journal for the year so that I can carry on and and not lose those things. I think some people are naturally journalers. I think other people are not, or, or they're like you, they just weren't drawn to it out of confusion or it didn't feel appealing or it felt heavy or one more thing I have to do. So like the pause journal is really, really, really simple. It is a easy on-ramp, yes. very, very simple prompts. It's not 30 minutes of self-reflection or even 30 minutes of prayer, although it does help to write out your prayers sometimes. Mm-hmm. But the gang, the research on journaling that's been done by the medical community and the, and the psychological community over the years is just fascinating. I'm going to name five things to see if I can allure you. Journaling reduces stress. And this is a this is a known thing that to write out your emotions, to write out your questions reduces the stress in your body and therefore in your soul, in your spirit. And then secondly, journaling therefore improves immune system function because stress is the great enemy of health, right? Yes. So it all, right. always begins with stress and inflammation. You've all read articles on this, I'm sure, but chronic inflammation is the source of all disease, chronic inflammation somewhere in the body. And so to get the emotions out, to get the questions out, to enjoy communion with God actually improves your physical well-being. And it keeps your memory sharp, which is something I am really craving in these days. Alan and I were joking (laughs) about COVID brain before we started rolling the recording here, but it's just unbelievable, gang, The, the number of friends, staff, allies who it's the short-term memory loss these days yeah and it's that's trauma that's the sign of the two years of the pandemic and the chaos and the global stress and all that Um, so i think we could all use some help with cognitive clarity and journaling actually does that like it actually improves mental clarity it boosts your mood and it strengthens emotional functioning because as you as you kind of lasso your thoughts as you lasso your emotions as you put them down invite Christ into them that's the important part it's not just right journaling is not a diary by yeah. the way it's not i woke up and had you know cheerios for breakfast <laughs> i went to work and then dan said it was time for a meeting it's not that it's not right. a record right. of events journaling is the story of the soul. It's your heart. It's where you are these days. It's where you're inviting God into. 
to saturate you with his love and to saturate you with his life, to counsel you, lead you, guide you. And the research is that if you do this over time, it strengthens your emotional functioning, meaning you actually get a better grip on your own emotions. You, be, you become more of the shepherd of your own soul rather than feeling like your emotions have the keys to the bus and they're just taking you anywhere they want to take you. Yeah. And John, until you just named that, I didn't have the words for what I'm about to tell you, but oftentimes at the end of a day when I'm not journaling, I'll come home and Kelly will ask, how was your day? And you know, some of the time I'll be like, it was okay. Well, what went wrong? Well, I don't, I don't really know. And, and we'll go through that period where she can tell something's off or I'm wrestling with something, but I can't answer her question when I'm not journaling because I haven't processed it. So it's just this unnamed kind of, yeah. you're just off. But when I am journaling, it's amazing how it helps you have an examined enough life to where you can go, yeah, I'm just working with God on, you know, anger or worry, or he's showing me this. And so the five points you just named, I can see now how it reduces stress and how it, you know, actually strengthens your emotional abilities and functions because you actually are working through those things with God in a very practical way. Yeah. In fact, coming into the new year, as I was finishing last year's journal, and they don't, they don't always, for me, start and stop neatly at the beginning of a year, but it happened to this year, I had questions for God. I had questions, and I don't want to put the pressure on a single moment mm -hmm. to get an answer. This, this is one of the things. It'll be really helpful, folks, with listening prayer. Give it some time. When you're asking God, especially important questions, questions that feel laden with implications, give it some room and therefore journal it out, write it down and, and ask the questions and then give it weeks to yeah. explore that with God and to hear from him. Because a lot of times, you know, we'll try and bring all that to one moment of prayer. Lord, you know, is this the year for us to move? You go, well, I didn't hear anything. <laughs> That's, of course you did it. That's brutal. You can't right. expect that of your mm. soul. There's just too much stress in there. So I had some questions for God. One of them was, how do I build margin into my life this year? Because I want to be one of the wise bridesmaids. I want to be, I want to be the one who is storing up extra oil not just, well, I made it through today. You know, I'm, I'm doing good because I didn't burn out today. It's like, well, actually, do you have extra? Are you bringing extra wow. into the year, into the month, into the situation that's in front of you? So we do think we're in the hour of the 10 bridesmaids. We think that the focus of our lives as the followers of Jesus this year really does need to be on cultivating practices, arranging our lives each day to provide for more of God. And it's going to become really obvious. This isn't rocket science. What's the stuff that gets in the way of that? You drop as much of that as you can. Yes. And what's the stuff that historically helps you with that? Well, you go get, get that going again. Like, I need to pick up the pause app again, you know, and, and get back to that simple, beautiful practice. Okay. So the one minute pause journal is out. And one of the things I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to do a couple of Facebook live events. If you'd like to join me on January 25th or February 8th, I'm going to be talking about how to use the journal. I'm going to be answering questions around intimacy with God, union with God, benevolent detachment in an hour like this. And I think that'll be really fun for the, for the folks that are into that kind of thing. So if you want, you could grab your journal and begin to use it, get, get kind of the hang of it, and then join me on the 25th and on February 8th in the evening on Facebook Live, and we'll send some announcements and we'll, we'll make that more clear on the podcast as it gets closer. But I thought that would be a fun way yes. to have a community conversation around 
healthy journaling and how we use this and and how we get more oil. How do we get more of the presence of God in our life this year? This would be one really mm-hmm. simple practice. Yes. I think when we do that, John, uh, man, to go into this semester with the oil filled yes, God. is going to make the entire difference. Yeah. So let's yeah. ask for that. Let's just pray. Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, I want to be someone who is filled with the presence of God. I want, I need, I crave more of the actual presence of God in my life, sustaining me, strengthening, healing me, guiding and directing, encouraging me, bringing me joy and beauty and love and happiness. And so show me, show me this as I start my year, Lord, show me in this first semester, how can I cultivate oil, the oil of your presence in my life? What are the things I need to lay down to make some room? And what are the things I need to take up? We all are praying for this. And so we pray together in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you.